heads and pray. Father, I ask that you would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ, the knowledge of him being the Lamb of God who has redeemed us back to you by his own precious blood. We declare tonight, Revelations 5, 12, that worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Open the eyes of our understanding to see Jesus, the Lamb of God, like never before, so that we can see him in the scriptures and see Jesus in the Psalms. Tonight's teaching is called Jesus, the Song of All Songs. It's the introduction to the Psalms. There's a song in heaven being sung right now, and it will be sung throughout all eternity. It is the song of all songs. It's the song of the Lamb who is slain on our behalf to redeem us back to God by his own precious blood. The Psalms are songs, and they all point to the song of all songs, the song of the Lamb, as declared in Revelations 5 and Revelations 15. So as we begin our 2019 teaching series on the psalm, we must keep in mind the song of all songs, the song of the Lamb. How do we do this? We do this by viewing the psalms through the lens of the blood of Jesus Christ, Jesus' victorious work on the cross for us. At the Last Supper, Jesus, he gave us the new lens as he lifted up the Passover cup and he proclaimed in 1 Corinthians 11:26, he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Jesus redeemed us back to God. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In Psalm 1, 6, the end part, it says, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So if you don't want to go the way of the ungodly and perish, you'll need to believe in Jesus Christ and receive him into your heart so that you can have everlasting life. If you believe in Jesus Christ and have already received him into your heart, you'll be able to overcome Satan and his demonic kingdom of darkness, the source that is behind all evil in this world by his blood. Revelations 12, 11 says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto death. You overcome every giant, every obstacle that obstructs you from coming in and experience the fullness of your salvation in Jesus Christ, your promised land, by three things. By the blood of the Lamb, by the word of your testimony that comes in agreement with what the blood of Jesus Christ has done for you. And the third thing, not loving your lives unto death. Not loving and holding on to your fleshy thinking and feeling that contradicts what the blood of Jesus Christ has done for you. Without the lens of what Jesus' blood has already accomplished for you, you'll be viewing your own life, the life of those around you, your circumstances and the world, God himself, his son Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit as revealed by the scriptures and by the Psalms from a distorted point of view, a view that does not come in agreement with what the blood of Jesus has done for you. Romans 1, 16 through 17 states, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation 
for everyone who believes, to the Jews first and also to the Greeks. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The just shall live by faith. I'm not ashamed of wearing these new lens purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God onto my salvation. This new lens is the lens of the new covenant, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Psalms, similar to the rest of the Bible, from the book of Genesis through Revelations, points to Jesus, the one who has redeemed us back to God by his blood. Colossians 1, 13 through 14 says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood. And then I love Ephesians 1, 7 because it adds this little phrase at the end. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. According to his, the riches of his grace, his unmerited favor. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you have unmerited favor. You have been redeemed from the power of darkness and conveyed into the kingdom of his everlasting love. Because of God's everlasting love, God said to Joshua, as he did to us, he says, be strong and courageous. Do not fear and do not be discouraged. We must honor the Lamb of God by not coming into agreement with the spirit of fear and discouragement and loving it, our own fleshly thinking and feeling more than our Savior, Jesus Christ. Your blood has accomplished two new realities in your life. It has accomplished you becoming righteous and you becoming a child of God. The moment that you invited Jesus Christ into your heart to dwell, a miracle took place. You became a new creation in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What are the old things that have passed away? It's your old identity, your old darkened nature. It's your old spirit man where Satan, he ruled and reigned over your heart. You have been delivered from, past tense, this power of darkness. How did you get into the kingdom of darkness? It was by no choice of your own. You were born into this kingdom because of the first Adam via the fall. You were born with a sin nature. Romans 5.19 says, For as by one man's disobedience, that's Adam, you were made a sinner. That's an identity statement. You are made a sinner through the act of one man, Adam. The title of this series is Choices Determine Destiny. So the best choice that you and I could ever make in our life is inviting Jesus Christ into our heart to dwell. Amen? And at the end of this service, if you haven't invited Jesus Christ into your heart to dwell, I'll give you an opportunity to do so. But when you have chosen... Jesus Christ to come into your heart and dwell. You went through a spiritual rebirth. You were born again, according to John 3, 5 through 7. And according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you became a new creation. Now listen to what Romans 5, 19 says, the last part. So also by one man's obedience, that's Jesus Christ, many will be made righteous. That's once again, is an identity statement. You were made righteous through the obedience of Jesus Christ, not through your own obedience. 
Hallelujah. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 5.21, four verses later after 5.17, it explains to us the core new creation reality. It says this in 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we would become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Your new identity in Jesus Christ is that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The real you is your spirit man. The real you is righteous. And this was made possible, hallelujah, not through your own good works, but through the work of Jesus Christ, his perfect obedience. So what does righteousness mean? It means that your spirit man was made holy as he is holy. Your spirit man is 100% holy. You see, when you invited Jesus Christ into your heart, the fullness of the Godhead came into your heart, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will not dwell in a temple that is unholy. That is why you are holy as he is holy. Another word that might be easier for you to understand and to remember when you think about righteousness is this word justified. You break it apart just as if I'd never sinned justified, just as if I'd never sinned. This means that your sins have been completely blotted out from God's record. So when God looks at you, he sees no sin on you. He sees his son, Jesus Christ. He sees you through the lens of his son, Jesus Christ, who has made you holy as he is holy. Romans 5, 9 says, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So every day you get up in the morning, what do you need to do? Put on the rose colored glasses. And as you wear these new lenses purchased by Jesus's blood, you will be able to view God and you will be able to view yourself from the proper perspective, from the truth of what the blood of Jesus Christ has done for you. So now when you look at God through the lens of the blood of Jesus Christ, you can see that God is no longer condemning you, but rather God has justified you. And then when you look at yourself, you're able to see, oh man, I am no longer a sinner. I am righteous. I am justified. Amen? The second reality of being a new creation in Christ Jesus is that you have been restored back to God by the blood of Jesus Christ. You have been adopted by him. You become his child. Romans, uh, Revelations 5, 9 says, you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Therefore, because God has re redeemed you back to him because of the precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ, you are now part of God's family once again. You are his child. He has restored you back to the time before Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden. Galatians 4, 7 says, Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ Jesus. You're no longer a slave to sin. You're no longer a slave to the law. You're no longer a slave to the kingdom of darkness and Satan. You are the son of the Most High God. 
And Romans 8, 17 says, And if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Everything that belongs to God belongs to you because you're a joint heir with his son, Jesus Christ. That's huge. And besides that, you also inherit his own divine nature. In the prodigal son story, which I call the loving heavenly father story, God says to you tonight, as he did to the elder son, he says, all I have is yours. That's from Luke 15, 31. You need to hear that because, see, the elder son was trying to work for his inheritance. You don't need to work for what already belongs to you. The elder son did not realize that everything that belonged to his father belonged to him. So he wasn't enjoying what God, what his father had already given to him. How can you walk in these two new creation realities? Your righteousness and knowing that you are a child of God. It's a principle called beholding and becoming. If you take a look at this picture that I showed you last week of that little girl looking into the mirror and looking at the lion of the tribe of Judah, you will see she looks into the mirror and she says, Oh, man, I'm just like my father. I'm just like Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are be being transformed into that same image from glory to glory. Every day the Lord wants you to behold the Lamb of God. John the Baptist before Jesus began his ministry, in John 1, 29 says this, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And guess what in heaven is happening? Revelations 5, 6. Behold, in the midst of the throne stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Forever and ever we'll be holding the Lamb of God. And as we behold him, he wants us to understand that we are like him, that we are righteous, that we are truly his children. 2 Corinthians 5.17, God says to us, Behold, all things have become new. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should become children of God. When you look, we talked about this last week, into the mirror of God's word and you behold the Lamb of God, you have a choice whether you're going to believe what he says through the word of God, or you're going to go ahead and believe what your feelings and your emotions are telling you at any certain time, which are always subject to change, right? This is never subject to change. God wants you to behold, and he wants you to become like him. Amen? One of the best things you can do in the morning is look at yourself in the mirror, the mirror of the word of God, and say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am his child, and I am loved by him. Amen? So, in this teaching series on Choices Determine Destiny, you'll be discovering many, many more things that you can behold about who God is and who you are in the Psalms. And every time you behold something new that kind of like you can't wrap your mind around it, you'll need to make a choice. Will you believe the truth 
or you're going to go buy what you thought in the past that is kind of distorted from the truth. You have a choice. Now, in the Bible, we, I'm going to tell you two stories. And two different groups of people decided differently of what they were going to believe as they looked at Jesus. After Jesus' resurrection, there's two men, and they're walking on the road to Emmaus, and they are discouraged. They thought that Jesus Christ was going to redeem the people of Israel, and now he's been crucified, and he's been put into a grave, and, oh, man, they are really brokenhearted. Now, they had heard the story about some woman who said, the tomb is empty. Two angels appeared to us, and they said that he's no longer here. These two men, they couldn't wrap their mind around such thoughts. That was just an idle tale. That was just make-believe, something too good to be true. Of course, those women were making up stories. Who can believe a story like that, right? So, Jesus comes walking with them, says to them, Why are you discouraged and sad? And Jesus says, and they describe everything that's going on into their hearts. Don't you know? Don't you know, Jesus? Don't you know? Don't you know, Jesus? They don't know it's Jesus, though. Jesus says, oh, foolish ones and slow to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. And beginning at Moses and all the prophecy expounded to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Luke 24, 27. Oh, man, what Jesus had just told them about himself in the scriptures, it started to stir their heart. And they said, oh, Jesus, just come and abide with us. Come and have a meal with us. It's really late, you know. You, you just come and sit with us for a while. They didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus starts sitting with them and starts breaking bread. And their eyes are opened and they see Jesus. And immediately he vanishes. Now, they had just walked seven miles from Emmaus, and they're so excited, all that discouragement, all the sadness had left them because they saw Jesus, that they run back from Emmaus to Jerusalem to tell the disciples. So they're in the midst of telling the disciples about Jesus, and Jesus appears. And Jesus says, to all of the disciples, Luke 22, 44 through 45. These are the words which I spoke to you while still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Basically, Jesus was saying, hey, the whole Bible, it's about me. The whole Bible points to me. So when we're reading the Psalms, we really need to consider this. We need to look that in the Psalms, they are pointing us to Jesus Christ, just like he told these disciples. Now, there's another story I'm going to tell you here the two men on the road to Emmaus, they believed. Now I'm going to tell you another story where Jesus, they hear Jesus, they see Jesus, and they don't believe. This story happens among Jewish leaders and their followers. John 5. Jesus healed a man who was lame for 38 years. Jesus said to this man, Arise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. When the Jewish leaders found out, they began to persecute Jesus and wanted to kill him. The audacity of Jesus wanting to heal a man that's been lame for 38 years on a Sabbath? Is he out of his mind? 
What kind of physician would want to heal somebody that's been lame for 38 years? Come on. Jesus, as they, he gets questioned, he starts to answer the Jewish leaders in the, while they're in front of the followers. He answers them. And basically he tells them that he is God. Whoa. Can you imagine what the Jewish leaders thought and felt? They just wanted to kill him all the more. And God, through Jesus, his son, says this. He says, you have been diligently studying and applying the scriptures, but you do not understand that they are about me, they point to me, they testify of me. Look at John 5, 36. He says, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Verse 37, and the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. John 5, 39, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them that you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. John 5, 40. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Even though Jesus, the awaited Messiah, was standing right in front of them, they did not see Jesus. Matthew 13, 14 through 16 tells us, And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. So as you join us in this 2019 teaching series on the Psalms and begin to meditate on Jesus, what he's telling us in the scriptures through the Psalms, will you believe him? Will you see him? Will you see that the scriptures in the Psalms are pointing to Jesus? You don't have to try to force and try to make this happen. It'll start to happen for you just like it has to me as I have started to meditate on Psalm 1. What I'm telling you today are things that come from meditation and I have seen Jesus. I wasn't trying to look really hard. He just starts emerging from the page because as you begin to talk with Jesus and walk, with Jesus and tell him, abide with me, stay a while, break bread with me, Lord. And then it's like the two men on the road to Emmaus. He opens up your eyes and you see him and then your heart starts to be filled with joy and skip and you see Jesus there in your midst, in your life, talking and walking with you. So, the ancient rabbis and many people today, they don't see Jesus. So when you study the Psalms, I want you to pray Ephesians 1, 17 through 18, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, would give you wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, that he would open up the eyes of your understanding so that they would be enlightened and that you would know Jesus. God's salvation story about Jesus is throughout the Psalms. The Apostle Paul summarizes the principal beliefs about our salvation that were fulfilled by Jesus according to the scriptures. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, basically says, Jesus died for our sins, he was buried, and he rose again, and then he was seen by many, many people. Throughout the Psalms, we see key elements of salvation story. It begins in the Garden of Eden, where Adam's choice to sin set in motion God's redemptive plan for mankind through his son, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. The scarlet thread is seen from the beginning of the first book in the Bible, Genesis, all the way to the last book, Revelation. 
and it is seen from the very first chapter in Psalm, the scarlet thread of Jesus, all the way to the last chapter in the Psalms. And then, this is what excited me just a few days ago as I started to look and I started to see this word salvation in the Psalms. And I started to look it up one night and I looked up psalm after psalm after psalm after psalm after psalm. There's so many psalms. I finally, I had such a long list for you guys. I have not included that in your list because there's so many that have this word salvation. And the salvation in Hebrew is Yeshua. And you know what that means in English? Jesus. So throughout the Psalms, Jesus' name is mentioned in Hebrew. And you see it translated as salvation. Sometimes you see this word translated, the salvation, translated with varying meanings, all different types of salvation that God provides for us. It's very similar to the word sozo that we see in the New Testament in Greek. Sozo in Greek means healed, whole, delivered. And that's the same with this word salvation in Hebrew, Yeshua. Because Jesus, through the power of his blood, can save you from everything and anything in your life. That's why it takes on such varied, mean, varied meanings. There's no one word in the English language that encompasses the fullness of salvation for that Greek word sozo. And I'm sure it's the same for that Hebrew word salvation, Yeshua. Now Yeshua is exactly what you see in the Psalms, is what appears in Matthew 1, 21. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus Yeshua, Yahweh, the Lord is our salvation, for he will save his people from their sins. Luke 2, 29 through 30. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. My eyes have seen Yeshua. My eyes have seen Jesus. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. God has highly exalted Jesus and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and they shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Sickness must bow its name to the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Poverty, I declare, poverty must bow its name to the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Broken relationships must bow their knee to the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeshua, the name that is above every name, must bow its knee to the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You and I need to bow our knees before our Lord Jesus Christ and allow everything else in our lives to bow accordingly. Now I'm going to talk to you about the shaping of our hearts through the Psalms. When the Psalms originated among the Israelites, their lives centered around God. They responded to God in good times with thanksgiving and praises. And in times of need and crisis, they cried out to God for help. There are two types of Psalms, basically two types. There's the songs of thanksgiving and praise, and the songs of laments when people cry out for help. Now, unlike most songs, 
that are first written and then sung, these psalms were sung for a long period of time by many, 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 many people in many, many services before they are ever written down. So the person that sang the song originally is not the person who ended up writing it down. When the psalms began, the act of praying and singing was united together. And in the psalms, we'll see that mingling of prayer, the mingling of poetry, and the mingling of song. And it's because of this that we find out that the psalms touch hearts and transform our hearts and minds. It touched and transformed hearts and minds of people long time ago throughout the ages and continue to touch the hearts and the minds of people today. Despite the fact that now these psalms, they might be very difficult for us to understand because we don't have maybe that historical understanding or that language they use in the psalms may be difficult. But because the psalms are songs, and their poetry, they will touch your heart very, very deeply. And because they are inspired by God himself, they will allow you to express your emotions, your feelings and your thinking before God. They allow you to express emotions that arise from core issues that we all confront in our life. But then the Psalms will help you to align your emotions and thoughts with the emotions of thoughts of God himself. God's command to Joshua, Joshua 1.9, was a call to have his emotions, just like it's a call to have your emotions brought under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And they are inspired by Jesus Christ. Let's look at four words from Joshua 1.9 and see a sampling of what the psalm says. Joshua 1.9. It says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So you take a look at strength. And there's many psalms on strength. This is just a sampling, Psalm 28.7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices and with my song, I will praise him. Courage. What does the psalm say about courage? This is a sampling, Psalm 31, 24. Be of good courage. Be courageous and he will strengthen your heart, all you who hope in the Lord. What do the Psalms say about fear? Here's a sampling, Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? What do the Psalms say about discouraging, discouragement? Once again, this is a sampling, Psalm 42, 5. Why are you downcast, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, for he is the help of my continence. Although the Psalms are truly sung prayers to God, as people are processing their lives with God, we also must remember that they are inspired by the Holy Spirit, just like all scripture. Therefore, the Psalms could be entitled God's Prayer Manual, but because they all point to Jesus, we could call them Jesus' songbook. In the early churches, they gathered together for their church services in the home. What do you think they did? They ate a meal, they broke bread together, and they sang. They would stand up in the middle of the meal, and one person would sing, then another person would sing, and another person would sing. That's how church was, not like today. James 5.13 says, Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. 
Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Ephesians 5, 18 through 19. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So we know that the early church and throughout the ages, people sang and prayed the psalms. But how about Jesus? Did you know that Jesus quoted the psalms more than any other book that he quoted in the Bible? Perhaps he quoted the Psalms because people knew them so well and he knew he needed to touch the people's hearts and to give new revelation about the new covenant that he was beginning. As Jesus spoke about the Psalms, he brought new meaning and he also showed how the Psalms were being fulfilled through him. Here's two examples, Psalm 110, 11. You see this appear in Psalm 110, 11, in Mark 12, 36 and 37. Then Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How is he? then his son. In this, Jesus is proving that he is a Messiah. He's not only David's son, but he's David's Lord. And even after I say this, it might sound pretty confusing to you. It appears in most of the Gospels, but the Jewish leaders understood what he was saying, but they could not believe it. Then, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he quoted from Psalm 41, 9. He said, in, in Psalm 41, 9, it says, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. And this appears in John 13, 18 through 19. Jesus says, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. So Jesus, he went and spoke the Psalms, but did he sing the Psalms? Okay, in Matthew 26, 30, we see, and when they had sung a hymn, they went to, out to the Mount of Olives. And when they sang a hymn, so at the last supper, the first day of the Passover, before Jesus goes to Gethsemane and Golgotha, he's sitting with his disciples and he sings with them. What does he sing? He sings what the Jews sang on the first day of the Passover, the Hallel, Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. So let's take a look at what are some of the things that could have been sung when Jesus knew that he was going to go and be crucified. Psalm 118.6, The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Psalm 118, 23, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Psalm 116, 5, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. The song of the Lamb is another song that Jesus could be singing. The song of the Lamb is Yeshua's victory song, the victory song of Jesus that is being sung in heaven for all eternity. This song is not only about Jesus, but it's about our loving Heavenly Father. I think that Jesus is singing this song. 
Revelations 15.3 talks about the song of all songs. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works. Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all the nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments have been manifested. And when you look up, the song of all songs, the song of the Lamb, many things that are said in the song of songs, the song of the Lamb, come from the Psalms. So, my question to you for the week is, what song will you choose to sing? Will you choose to sing a new song, not the song of your circumstances, but rather will you sing a song that comes in agreement with what the blood of Jesus Christ has done for you? Will you choose to sing the song of all songs, the song that all the psalms point to? When you sing, songs that are in accordance with what the blood of Jesus Christ has done for you. It says in Psalm 22, 3, that God himself is enthroned in your praises. God's presence comes. And when his presence comes, he comes to redeem. He comes to save you and I. So be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be afraid. For the Lord your God has come to save you. Amen. So, Father, we thank you for the, tonight's teaching, and we pray that your word that has gone forth would richly dwell in our hearts through faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming.